Welcome everyone to our governance call number 11. My name is Orhan and I am one of the governance facilitators. And today on the agenda, we will start with a brief governance update. And then we have a new proposal going on that we will be talking about as well, a block reward and improvement of the collator cycle. And we will also be talking about the collator onboarding and we have an important discussion to start about the founding documents of the DAO. And then lastly, we will talk a little bit about like what are the limits of governance and we'll come back to what that means when we get there. Let me post the agenda here in the chat for everyone to see. So this is what we are aiming to cover in this call. Now, as for past uh, governance update, we, um, I started making a post to the um, governance call post, a reply where I write down which proposals have passed since the last call. So I'm not going to go too much into details into that because everyone can go in and read it there. Let me just link to it here so anyone can stay updated. And in addition to that, we have a uh, spreadsheet that is publicly available where you can see all ongoing governance processes and an archive of which ones have ended and the outcome of them. So everyone can stay updated that way. So we will not spend a lot of time going through that. Now, one of the important updates um, proposals we have that have passed is the new governance process. So from now on, we have a new governance process and the way it's different from the previous one is that we have defined the different proposal types and how what the process for each of them should be. That's like the main difference and that has passed. So we are using that one from now on. Another important uh, thing that recently was, uh, was added is a subscription function to Subsquare. So you can now subscribe to all on-chain events on Subsquare and get notified by email every time there is an on-chain motion or a treasury proposal made. So you can see whenever there is something submitted and stay updated with everything that way. There's a post on the forum as well for that where you can see how to do it. It's very simple steps. So that's the brief governance update. and. Um, as I said, we have an ongoing proposal right now for block rewards and the collator cycle. And Ivan will be talking about that now. So if you are there, it, the stage is yours, sir. Thank you, Orhan. Yeah, the governance group and coordination group would like to propose to the community a new proposal that was already published on the forum yesterday. This proposal will implement in first part a uh, block reward to centrifuge chain and in second part implement and improve the collateral reward cycle. The main question that should be answered is why this proposal is important for the protocol and why we would like to implement it now. So the treasury has the primary importance in the development and future of any project uh, because any activity of the project that benefits centrifuge would be funded by the treasury. So we are talking about education, research, security operation, community events. Just now, Centrifuge Treasury has only 18 CFG, and so we cannot fund any proposal. We have uh, each, uh, we should to pay each month to collect is 5,000 CFG. Alternative way could be funding uh, with separate request. Uh, this will request a minting uh, of tokens this actual governance process, minting of tokens request a lot of time because we should create RFC, we should discuss them uh, after we should pass to the snapshot voting and referendum. So we are talking about 21, 25 days of process. And in case of collateral payment, this process should be repeated each month. So we believe that this block reward is important for the future of the centrifuge protocol and the com in the community. What we are going to propose, we would like to propose implement and activate a rose block with this parameter. 
inflation rate 3%. This is the same value that we had before the immigration to Polkadot, set the epoch duration uh, 12 hours, and the, the amount will be minted every epoch. So annually, we will fund the treasury for 14.67 million CFG. One main thing that I would like to emphasize is that recently we introduced a burning rate, this actual value is zero, and we also increased the cost of transaction fee. So in the future, we could find the balance and trade off between the inflation and uh, burning. And once the pools uh, will be launched on chain, we can stabilize the total supplies. The second part of this proposal regarding the collateral cycle. We'd like to implement the introduced collateral cycle. Each collateral will work for one session, one session, so two sessions a day. And in this way, uh, we will minimize the situation where a collateral that is removed from the set in the first half will not get any rewards. Yeah, that's all I see. Thank you very and much. Much more information I see in Cassidy and Miguel could provide regarding the technical part of this proposal. The RFC will be open for two weeks. So if anyone would like to leave any feedback and comments, they could do this on the forum. Thank you very much, Ivan, for presenting that one. So Basically, very short, what this proposal is about is to mint some tokens into the treasury to fund it in the short term and to also reward the collators for uh, with the with thousand CFG per month each collator. So that's what this proposal is about. And you can read more details about it on the forum in the link that Ivan also posted in the chat. So are there any questions, any comments on this proposal? So yes, one quick follow-up. Um, yeah, go ahead. I don't want to speak out of terms. I didn't see anybody raising a hand. Um, is the inflation rate still going to be 3%? Or is that, did I hear that correctly? That is correct. It's 3% inflation every year that goes into the, the treasury and covers the collator cost as well. So it will be done automatically at the yeah, same yeah. time. So it's basically two proposals in one, like one for the funding of the treasury, for the minting of the tokens, and also to reward the collators. Do we have an outline of the expectations from the collators? Uh, none that I have heard, but this is a good opportunity to hear them now. Are there any collators in the call? Who want to comment on that? Yeah, you can ask. Sorry, what was it about? We're not a, we're not a collator on Centerview yet, but. Um... Yeah, we, we were a validator, so you can ask your question. Sam, can you please repeat your, uh, your question? Well, you had? Uh, could, do we have an outline of the expectations from the collators that we're receiving 1,000 centrifuge a month? Yeah, well, there are expectations is to collate blocks, the liveliness of the network. Uh, they don't supply the security. Um, but essentially like a, like a smooth block operating, uh, like keeping it up, like keep creating blocks. That's, that's the goal of the collators. Yeah. And, and, uh, in terms of liveness uptime, do we want to establish some specs around, um, performance and tie that to the compensation? Well, I, I don't know all about that, but I think um, I think like none of these things have been implemented on any substrate network yet. Uh, even though each each team does it differently, uh, however, um, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think. I think the first goal is anyway, like to first get this thing started, and then from there on, uh, you can um, yeah set metrics around it, like 
what is expected of uh, uptime. You can even implement it in the palette if a collator doesn't sign um, X percent of the blocks in an epoch, you could basically kick them out and they could join again or have a very different set of rules. But um, yeah, it's it's fully up to the centrifuge uh, network. So would it be helpful to hear from some folks on you know best practices or suggestions on how we might want to do that? Or do we want to go ahead? Maybe Miguel, Miguel, you, you have some thoughts? Yeah, so the the collator selection palette that we use uh, comes with a very, very, very simple built-in way of, of uh, removing a collator from the set in the case that they don't produce a, you know, a block in a session. Um, that is, of course, is not sufficient uh, in the future when this is way more open um, for for anyone to just try to uh, to become to to become a to, to become a collator. Um, right now, we don't have. There's nothing in the, you know, in the in the official support from from Polkadot for collators that you can add some staking mechanism for collators to come in to get a slash if they misbehave, um, and then of course get the reward. So this collator selection is fairly simple, uh, and it doesn't have any any uh, you know like any more sophisticated way of of to, of checking that the collator is behaving well, other than just collating or producing blocks to help on the throughput of the network. Um, in a particular session, I think that's the only the only check that we have as part of that that collator. Uh, in the future, we could of course add um, you know more things, but the idea is that over time uh, we could you know we could definitely run internally metrics uh, or anyone can run metrics on like the who were the authors of the last session and check how many blocks have been produced. Is below the average, above the average? And we can do some smart things like that, um, then propose um, different collator rotation. But the collator rotation will come whenever it's all done on chain. So we don't, you know, no one, we centrifuge or um, the no one can control that. It will be part of the, the code that has been reviewed, has been um, added into the chain through governance. Uh, hello, do you hear me? We do. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm from the Polkadotters team, like also collators on the Al Altair network. And uh, yeah, I think one part is uh, that maybe the team uh, can do some uh, some uh, measures to, to check if, if collators are doing their job properly. Uh, like having some uh, monitoring and uh, alerts for uh, for the whole set, uh, which is done already done, for example, uh, in in projects like Astar or uh, Hydra DX Basilisk. Uh, and then of course, uh, like select uh, a trustable. Uh, players and uh, that that are proven in the system that uh, that can show some some of the best practices like having their own uh, monitoring and uh, and backups in place so yeah that's that's what I think Lucas what do you think is a you know simple but but a good way to make progress here. I mean, I, I said in the chat, like there's a bunch of parachains that implemented fairly complex staking pallets and other mechanisms. Um, so, and and I, I think like when we looked at those, we said, actually the, the secu they're not providing um, security. Um, they're providing basically liveness of the network. So adding all that code just for that was actually a something that we we deemed like was an unnecessary risk, right? Because every code you need to audit, you need to make sure it actually works, it adds complexity. Um, when like the worst case scenario is basically a collator not providing service and then having to be manually removed with a governance motion, it's very easy to see if collators are performing or not. So if they don't perform, like it's it, it's also easy to um 
to create a governance motion to to remove them. And the worst case here for us is we spend um, like the network spends right a thousand CFG on a, on a month of of collating work that the, that wasn't actually performed. So like comparing that with like the the effort of auditing and reviewing and integrating like a more complex pa um, palette that isn't as established today as as we would want it to be, I think is is totally it's, it's very clear to say no. We'll go with the like in my opinion to say okay, like it's it's a better idea to do this manually for now. In the long run, I I definitely think this will get automated. Um, and and I think um, in the yeah as 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 validatrium pointed out, I think in the beginning the goal is to use like known community members that are have the infrastructure that can do it that um, uh, we know are going to be hopefully reliable um, that we don't actually have the problem that we need to constantly update the collator set um, and then and then we can see right yeah, that that would be my take. One final consideration for me is, uh, is there merit in adjusting the schedule from monthly to bi-weekly, weekly, weekly uh, which might be a win-win so that um, collators get paid more frequently, find value of money and so on. And um, there might be a greater sort of precision in possible removals coming in so that we don't spend a thousand CFG, but two fifty if it were weekly. If you know what I mean. But you say, uh, Miguel, is that something that is viable or possible to to do it that way to make the payouts more frequently? I mean, the payouts. Um, if this proposal goes through, the the payout will be done every every uh, twice a day, basically twelve hours. Every yeah. twelve hours, there will be a payout of of rewards. Now, the Every 12 hours is when we have configured to for collators to cycle too. They don't provide a, a block uh, in that period of time. So that is uh, that's going to be part of this proposal. I see. So the monthly issue was just uh, how quickly the governance can respond. I mean, if it's an emergency thing, it could move quicker if there is collators that are not producing blocks. Um, to have them out of the set, but but yeah, so that's a monthly is basically the one thousand is monthly divided distributed pretty much every twelve hours, uh, the correspondent um, amount. I can see what the word is. All right. In principle. Any more questions or input uh, on this proposal? Otherwise, the RFC is open on the forum, so feel free to ask your questions, come with your inputs in that post, and we can continue it there. Um, but now we are talking about collators. Uh, is it, um, can you provide us with some information on when we can expect some new collators to be onboarded on Altair and uh, Centrifuge, Miguel? Um, I don't think we, we have a strong timeline for that yet. Um, I think the last, you know, the last months we've been all learning how, how this could work and, and see how the, 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 is it gain knowledge and expertise on running this in both environments? I think that um, we're pretty much ready to, to onboard more, but I think we just uh, need to make sure as well that, for, so for example, like the, certain percentage of the, the current out there uh, collators might be interesting to have them onboarded as well on the on centrifuge. I think we're very valuable because of the knowledge that that they have been gaining and the, 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 the great you know throughput that's been happening there. So I think that will be that will be a proposal I would like to put out. Uh, timeline I think is up to discussion. Um, I don't think I have any strong timeline. There is many things coming in. Um, updates from parity, uh, so uh, bigger ones. So I think, uh, yeah, there's something we need to prioritize uh, around. 
So when you say we are practically ready, does that mean both an Altair and Centrifuge or only Altair? Because we recently uh, onboarded five on Centrifuge uh, the end of last month. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Altair can go earlier than Centrifuge, of course, but... Um... All right. So in this proposal, are we also including an element of staking CFG for all leaders? In this uh, current proposal, you mean for the block rewards and the collator cycle? Yeah. No, there is uh, nothing with staking in that. It's simply for it's, the... Yeah, it's, it's bonding. So, um, you know, collator to be part of the setting is to bond some, some tokens. And those are blocked. But no, not the staking mechanism. That will happen much later. The amount involved in the bonding, uh, have we established that? If we that is already in place, yeah. We don't know the amount exactly, but 30,000. 30, 30,000, makes sense. Any other comments, questions to collator and this new proposal. Otherwise we can continue on the forum. All right then, let's move on to the next point on the agenda. And um, we are currently in the process of establishing our DAO and figuring out how we want to do these things, how we want to organize ourselves and how we want to get to where we want to go. So I will pass it on to Kate, who will talk a little bit about the founding documents of the DAO. So if you're ready, Kate, it's all yours. Thank you, Orhan. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Kate. This next part of the call, we're changing direction entirely away from uh, block rewards, collators, and those more technical things. And we're going to talk about the, the human side of being in a DAO, um, participation in governance, and particularly now that we've put this really amazing building block in place, which is the governance process, um, I think it's, in my personal opinion, um, I want to make some recommendations about us doing the work to put in some of our founding documents. Um, so I'm going to present some slides to you all, and I would really hope this is just opinions and, and ideas that I have. Um, I think we need to do a lot of discussion on this, because if we, like any founding document, if we agree to it, if we sign this treaty, if we sign up to it, we agree to be bound by it. And it has really long lasting consequences for, for action and behavior. So that's something I'd like you to all keep in mind as I talk you through this little presentation. Of course, there I made a, a post on the forum yesterday with um, with this this proposal. It's it's more of a discussion in um, in in a post. And now I'll just talk you through it in case you didn't have time to read it. So a core. Another core DAO pillar on top of the great governance process that we have are what I would call founding documents, what others may term a constitution. Um, and the reason why I think these are really important is that we are really surrounded by a lot of challenges right now in, in DeFi. I think I don't need to tell any of you that the kind of the dominant um, image of crypto, even if it is centralized exchanges, as well as DAOs is, you know, that we're kind of failing, that there's quite a lot of, um, yeah, disorder and distraction happening all around us. And I'm not gonna name names. I'm not gonna say FTX or Terra Luna <laughs> or the other, you know, there's much, there's a lot of talk about DAOs not making it also. And this is really sad and something that I think is actually a huge opportunity for us. That was not meant to be the next slide. Uh, yes, it was. Um, I'll go to this one. So I think we do have a huge opportunity um, in front of us 
in the face of all this like breakdown, we, i.e. the centrifuge DAO, all of you, we're building our DAO from a more progress progressive and intentional state. And so we have a really incredible opportunity to learn from other DAOs, as well as the history of all organizations. And so we have a lot of data, a lot of literature, a lot of lessons that we can use to try to avoid some of these big problems. And we can really use tools to help us build strong foundations. And it's important that we do this early. We need to put in some of these strong foundations now and not when it's too late. And of course, because when you do something that's important, it is necessarily hard. So things will get a lot harder than they are now. I have to go back one. So I wanted to uh, share just some kind of, it might be a bit strange for some of you, but this is like a framework from organizational. Um, it's called evolutionary organizational theory. And it's kind of this theory that um, human organizations have evolved, not necessarily in a linear way, but uh, throughout time with kind of core dominant characteristics. So down in this red circle here, we have a type of organization where chaos is the norm and where we have a lot of command and control authority and kind of one of the dominant characteristics is fear. Um, yellow, and these are all done in like, they're color coded. It's quite, quite interesting. I'll, I'll send a resource after this. Yellow is very typical of governments, this zone where, yeah, we accept that there's hierarchy. The core goal is stability. Formal process dominates most of our organizational um, capacity. You could say that governments are very um, uh, prone to capture, and that is quite a, a negative part of them. Corporations, and you know, this is by far the most dominant, I think, organization that we have in this world right now. Maybe and numerically, maybe there's more government, but corporations thrive, thrive on so-called meritocracy, on goals and KPIs, on a focus on innovation, amongst other things, also prone to monopolies. Startups, especially kind of the new, new fun startups, aim for, you know, focus on a lot of participation and engagement and empowerment. Fun team with happy users. Uh, cool brands, but they also can be captured by political games in terms of their organizational structure. And then we have this zone, which is called teal, this color. Um, it can be thought of as like more network orgs where they're actually self-organizing. There isn't like a command and control authority in the middle. There isn't like a so-called meritocracy. Um, there is distributed decision-making. There is a lot of awareness. They are dynamic in that they move like um, they have a good level of uh, network effect. They can move very fast. Uh, one of the downsides, maybe if you think of it as a downside, could be that they're quite complex. Um, and I think that you could, this is just a random mapping of where I think a bunch of DAOs are across this evolutionary development of DAOs, if you will. I think that's quite a lot of DAOs, sadly, who are down in the red zone, where it's like a lot of chaos. And behind the scenes, there is a lot of command and control authority. I don't think we have so many, and I'm not gonna name names, sorry. I'm really not. <laughs> There's not so many DAOs um, in this kind of yellow zone. I don't know of very many. There are a few still operating in the orange um, where, you know, there's a big focus on meritocracy, innovation, goals and KPIs. And that's, you know, that's fine. There's no judgment there. They may not be able to uh, get to the, the point that's needed because they're not able to work in, the, in very complex ways. There's a few dial, few dials, quite a few actually, I would say the majority, who occupy this green zone where they're really aiming for full participation. You know, at the core is like a, a fun team or, or DAO, and the focus is on happy crypto users. Um, what I think, like the only thing that's really going to work, and what I hope that we can uh, aim for is to be in this other zone here where we have distributed decision-making um, without necessarily full participation, full participation. We are truly self-organizing and that the nodes and the people can organize themselves, hopefully in, in small groups. There's a lot of awareness and we're really dynamic. 
So um, I'll keep moving and then I'll just check for questions in a minute. So I think in order to do this, in order to, to get to the zone where we're not imploding, we're not being taken over by um, inaction or decision fatigue where we can't make any decisions, there's you know too much governance and we only have 2% engagement and or there's just fighting on the forum all the time. We need to do some things to prevent that and to be very explicit about why we're doing this. Why are we being a DAO? Why do we even want distributed ownership? And I think we can be very clear in our objectives and that is very necessary. This is just, this is in the, um, in the post and you can read about it, but just as an example, let's have a clear objective that owners, which is anyone who owns the token should extend more access to people to borrow and lend money transparently by expanding, governing, and stewarding the centrifuge protocol. And that this means more than just individual extraction or possession by a small group. This is a stance of responsibility to give access to many, many more people. One of our objectives might be, in, in being a DAO, to avoid the protocol getting controlled by an entity that's not aligned with the shared mission. And so being a, a steward owner would mean preventing this, right, with our governance actions, with our decisions, pre preventing monopolization and takeover. And of course, there's other aspects of this too. We want robust participation in governance, but maybe we don't want everyone to be expected to participate in every governance process all the time. Um, and we also have a, a need, or a, I would say, yeah, there's some need to align the centrifuge protocol with regulatory guidance. I'm just going to stop for one second and see the questions. <laughs> okay, yes, I did say, I, did, I didn't compare DAOs to the mafia. That was just an example of how organizations can function. <laughs> so the next part of what I want to present is um, the fact that in the founding documents should be a very, very clear shared mission and a well-coordinated DAO. This just needs to be one sentence, easily remembered by everyone in the DAO. And this is what we're trying to achieve together. And so kind of my recommendation is that the governance and coordination group grab what we've got already, because there is um, a few things out there, condense that into one sentence and put that in the founding documents to be uh, approved or governed by the DAO. Um, another part, second part of the founding documents is principles. Um, this word is thrown around a lot. All DAOs that I've seen do have some guiding principles, and usually they involve the word decentralization. Um, a key part of the forum post I wrote was to say that there's too much implicit uh, misalignment on what this word even means, and that therefore I'm not proposing that we use it as the guiding principle along with many DAOs. If you disagree, Great, let me know and we will discuss. But I do think that we should have a guiding principle of open access, of transparency and of ownership. And I would propose some operating principles, which is how do we um, achieve the shared mission um, and these support these guiding principles in a more active way is to choose the simple over the complicated, to Always um, prioritize goodwill in guiding our communication and being bureaucracy light and, and making things explicit. And there's a lot more content on why I've written those things. Um, again, I, I really, really expect this slide or these points here to be the subject of a lot of debate because these are the things that we're going to hold each other to. When we make a decision about, you know, working with a new partner or an issuer and you know they can't commit to the level of transparency we want do we want to actually do it these are how we might use um, guiding principles come back to any discussion point on this later the next part of the founding documents would be a code of conduct because a DAO channel like discord or forum or even a call like this like this is not a social media platform that this is a place of business and business discussion and so moderation via a code of conduct 
is a very normal business activity of ensuring that users can participate without being abused or spammed. So a code of conduct is um, pretty essential. Um, and this is just some examples of what could be included in that example on this code, which would be the code that if you break it, there are consequences. And that needs to be decided as well. What are the consequences? Is there recourse if you, for example, break it, you don't think you broke it, you get kicked out, what's your recourse? That's part of this as well. And the last piece is levels of engagement, which is not very common um, in DAOs, I don't think. And this is like a, a newer development where people are realizing that not all owners or token holders in a DAO are the same. They don't have the same context or expertise, experience, capacity con to contribute or make decisions, nor do they have the same amount of tokens. And that is fine. That is fine and that is normal. And so therefore, it follows that there are different levels of participation in governance, as well as other things. Some people just want to participate on very large changes. Some members want to be involved in everything. Wonderful. And some owners do not want to participate in governance at all. Like even in the most so-called active DAOs, governance participation really pushes over 10%. So I think we need to be very aware of all these things and design for these I would call them enabling constraints. Um, so this le levels of engagement, I could see being reflected like, oops. Um, so we have largely passive token holders. They don't really want to be involved unless there's like a super crucial decision. And in the case they make it, they can still obviously govern. Any token holder can participate in governance all the time. But in these two zones here, where we have active contributors who are, you know, like some of our VC partners who are, you know, the ones attending this call or co commenting on the forum or hosting team and daily contributors at events around the world. They are what I would consider active contributors, partners like people from Ave, Maker, um, various development teams that we work with, as well as issuers. These are all, these are in this kind of second band where they're not like working on centrifuge every day, but maybe like a few times a week, that, that's pretty good. And then of course we have the daily contributors, which is ambassadors, team, people that work on it every day. And what I'm proposing is that this these levels of engagement are reflected in a chat tool. So therefore we don't just have this open discord and this open forum. Um, but we actually have a dedicated chat tool solely for those who meet the criteria of this black zone or of this orange zone. And that's where you're going to be getting a lot more context, knowledge transfer, and a lot more work is being done. So that will go in the, the part of the forum post that deals with the level of engagement, this particular um, idea, I guess, about how we need to have a chat tool that reflects these levels. So um, I'm pretty keen to discuss. That's a lot of information. Feel free to make any comments or clarifying questions on anything I've said. And I would love to discuss about your opinions on, on these founding documents or these tools. Do you believe that we need them? Any of them? Some of them? What questions or hesitations do you have? Is there something missing from what I shared or what I wrote? Um, yeah, so if, yeah. Thank you very much, Kate, for going through this. So this is uh, something we need to start talking about now already, because as Kate says, it's really crucial that we start defining these from the very beginning already. So we don't end up in situations where we don't know what to do or where we didn't have a plan for what to do. So what are your thoughts? Is this, uh, are these documents important? That's the main question here. I have something, but I'd like to hear if anyone else has something as well. Feel free to speak up. 
Don't be shy. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, Sam, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're saying oh, something. Said, yes, absolutely. Do you have any like concerns, Sam? Like I know, or are you like, yes, all of these and more? We need some more controls. Yeah, it's a giant social experiment. So the implications will play out downstream. It's hard to foresee it all. Um, but makes sense for the time being. Um, yes, we need a constitution uh, equivalent. And um, basically, we're all members in a DAO and making it explicit on what the terms of engagement are from how we communicate to what we wrote on, who participates for what, um, what will be our mission and what will be priority. All that is very crucial. It's like an operating agreement of an LLC or a constitution of a company of a country. Um, and so that all stakeholders can be transparently made aware of joint values and terms of agreement. Thank you, Sam. And you said an important word there, which is experiment, because we will have to try out. I think I read somewhere that there are like around 6,000 DAOs. There are probably much more than that, but most of them are failing. And there's probably a reason for why they're failing and not working as intended. So obviously, we don't want to reinvent the wheel because there are a lot of things we can use out there, but we need a set of wheels that can drive us where we want to go so it's about finding the right balance between like from learning from others experiences and being innovative ourselves and try to define how we want to create our own DAO but in terms of um, like the code of conduct that's one thing I believe is very important they're all important but I especially believe the code of conduct is going to be crucial to avoid conflicts and unpleasant situations later on. And I know some people might think that, that it leans towards centralization because well, we are limiting people in saying what they want. So I would like to hear what others think about that because I personally think we do need some guidelines on how to deal with these situations when someone is behaving inappropriately and then you have to define what inappropriately is, but like trolling, being offensive, and things like that. Like, how we, do we deal with it? So, what do others think? Is it the, is it a good idea, or is it being too centralized, having a code of conduct? No, if we all agree to what it is, then it is not centralized. Do all agree? Does that mean we I mean, need 100% and get turnout and consensus? Well, all agree is um, the human speak, which is not very precise. But once we declare that um, these are the rules and we are still choosing to be owners, we are buying into the contract of what that was. And how we choose to edit that or propose that may have a 51 percent 65 percent uh whatever approval but um ultimately there exists in some future they this is the con code of conduct and you know by being a member of the DAO through this token you are buying into that form agreement yeah i mean it's this is a tricky really tricky topic you know, silencing dissent is uh, is really bad for any organization that's trying to do uh, do great things. Um, dissenters are sometimes the uh, the voice of uh, new ideas, um, and it's good to have healthy conflict. Um, so, being able to balance healthy conflict with uh, with a code of conduct, I think, is uh, will be a tricky thing for us all to manage. I love this because I am a big fan of dissent, Rob. Um, I was 
I'll send you my, a paper I wrote called the Dissensus Protocol, which basically that's the philosophy that we cannot have truly like a functioning society unless there's room for dissent. Like if we don't have that room and if there is no like dissensus, which is like the opposite of consensus, then we are effectively an autocracy or an author authoritarian rule. So a code of conduct does not try to remove dissensus or dissent or the chance for that. It's just trying to say within the, the realm of what we are here to do, what is appropriate behavior? And I think so what you're getting at is like where, who like who are those with the powers to decide what's appropriate and what's not? Of course, we can try to clarify that in the code, but then there's the enforcement of the code, right? And like we have collectively already decided that the governance and coordination group, which is Ohan and MDOR, and they put that proposal forward and got the mandate that they would be the enforcers of this code. But like how do we as a DAO going forward ensure that there is this kind of dynamic um, um, yeah, power flows so that it's not like if MDR and Ivan, uh, sorry, Orhan don't really like you and they think that your your opinion is dissent, then they remove you. So that's, that's the current constant tension that I think you've named that we really just need to keep talking about. So if we could make it uh, very particular on an algorithmic basis uh, to the extent possible, it will reduce the uh, discretion that will put, you know, the executors of the code um, to at ease. Basically, this is the template of a post. This is the point of a remark and therefore um, do this. So the if this, then that statements, if they're particular, um, it would be in order for them to remove or exclude. And um, whoever's removed or excluded could still uh, make the case that uh, it wasn't in order because it wasn't in part of the algorithm. <laughs> and um, we could, modify the agreement, but there still needs to be an agreement in place, even if it's later reiterated on. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not a fan of trying to code or make algorithmic human interactions because I have I've have not seen it work well, but I do see your point about being very precise on like the in which case would someone be removed? But it, of course, let's remember, it's removed from a communication channel, not from the DAO essentially, because they still have tokens, they can still participate in governance. So yeah, I agree with being precise and trying to support the moderators in enforcement as much as possible. And perhaps we can design a system where it's not solely resting on them and that someone that's removed from a channel has clear recourse. I guess uh, we could maybe highlight some instances to help us think through it uh, so that um, we have some substance of recent events. Orhan, do you want to comment on recent experiences to inform our thinking here? Sorry, I didn't catch the reference of the question, uh, Sam. Could you please? The reference is. Uh, if we could think of a few instances where you had to remove someone from a channel, uh, is there guidance we can give you uh, that will make the exercise of discretion or the execution of a principle uh, more straightforward? And to arrive at that, maybe you could illustrate a few cases where that needed to happen. I don't know the scope of the problem to begin with, so having some examples could help. So what you're asking is like how you can help with making it easier to remove people from the channels if they behave inappropriately. Is that the... Uh, that's one way to say it. The actual removal is not hard, right? But to know no. that uh, the if statement is met, so then you will remove it to do that person. Um, just trying to clarify 
for you um, and whoever is executing it in the future, uh, what are the rules and the terms? Um, has there been cases where I don't know if this falls into that category or not? Um, mm -hmm. Just clarifying for you may be helpful with um, some example cases that it wasn't very clear. Well, there are always like these gray zones where you're not sure of whether you should take action or not. And we have been in those situations, just not many recently, but a while ago we had some issues with community members who were very offensive. And it was uh, hard to distinguish between when it is like regular thought and where it, when it's directly toxic. So that's why it's very important to be very clear about these definitions when, because Ivan and I in the governance and coordination group, we don't take it lightly to just ban people. It has to be like really scammers that they are the only ones that get banned and removed from the channels now. Otherwise, like people are free to voice their opinion, being critical. So it is very difficult. And we would like to hear some input from you guys as well. Like, what do you think is acceptable an acceptable reason for removing someone from Discord or from the forum? So it's oh, yeah. I think this is a good point, Ohan, that the creation of this code can be collaborative. So Sam and, and, and Rob and others who care about this or have been involved in this type of thing before, like as we create the code, it would be great, I think, if there was more back and forth so we can create this precision, create these um, recourse kind of actions, and that this could become, before we like enshrine this as our founding document, that this has really worked out. So, Ohan, I think it would be great once I post the, the work on the Code of Conduct. If people start commenting there, perhaps we could even form a small working group to really hash this out, because it is, it is, it is difficult. Absolutely. Um, before we end, I just wanted to... Uh, we, yeah, I don't think we're going to have time for the other big topic, but I'll just touch on it quickly, which is one of the principles that I think is perhaps slightly provocative in the world of DAOs is that is the one around the full one around um, not expecting so much um, participation and governance wanting participation in a meaningful way and this means that you know people with the right experience and knowledge participate on the decisions that um, those decisions are, or people that are really affected by a decision participate, but that we let go of this idea of really high levels of participation. Does anyone think that that's controversial or is everyone like, yeah, that's cool, let's go? Um, I think there's a lot of work we need to do to actually make participation easier. When you go to the governance forum, it's not clear where to start. It seems to be a rolling series of threads and you have to scroll down to the fourth one and then within that find you know hey this is governance and then within that uh, you have to find how to participate in governance um, it needs to be super obvious if we want the baseline to go up um, yes here's where you go here's the video um, here is you know screenshot of text instructions um, and you know, if this is a, your first time here, um, here are the places you could start, one, two, three, which one do you care more about? Just kind of making that forum um, snapshot on-chain voting process much more uh, easy because yes, it's an experiment and a lot of people have not participated in active DAOs. So if we have a part to play, uh, let's kind of, I'm suggesting we be cognizant of making it more obvious and actionable on our part as well. Cool. Yes, thank you, Sam. I think this point is a bit dependent on us. On it, It's assuming that we do have a clear and accessible governance process. So thanks for pointing out that it's not as easy as it could be. But in it, to Colin, what Colin is saying, um, you're in the cool let's go group. T tell me more. 
before we end the call. I had a feeling you'd do that. Um, no, I think uh, I think it's in line with what uh, Jerry said, right? The prin the principle the principles are reasonable and safe enough to try. And so I would be in the, this is safe. I feel secure. Let's go. Let's execute and let's try it. But I think you would pair that with a mindset, a collective community mindset of proposing solutions to um, asynchronously the things that we should be improved, that should be improved. Um, I think yeah, we have governance calls every so often, but there's a lot of like maybe it's maybe it is just like an improvements category or something on the forum, but just something where people can actually provide solutions or quick proposals to solutions that for problems that they see rather than just pointing out problems. Um, that's my view. Thank you, Colin. And I think that's going to be the last word for today. We are nearing the end of the call. So but great to see. This much, uh, this much engagement, and this is definitely something we need to continue with to uh, start working on the founding documents. So thank I you everyone. Macro for observation to share, um, which is this conversation of generally speaking, how we organize ourselves is important uh, and is key infrastructure, but um, there's probably also a layer of prioritization on what we talk about, such as what is key and crucial for our survival. Um, adoption, TVL, making it easy for uh, different players to come in. We haven't really covered uh, much about that in this governance call. I think the things that actually drive the success of Centrifuge for all of us uh, always need to have like a, a block of time in such governance calls. Great point, Sam. If you uh, want to post it in the, what you just said in Kate's post on the forum and we can continue the discussion there as well because this definitely needs more talking through before we reach a result we're all happy with. So, with that in mind, I'll say thank you for everyone for joining this call and uh, we will see you next month. Thank you, everyone. See you all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ohan. No Thanks, problem. everyone. Nice to see you.